Howdy again, this is Tubal Kane and this is tips number 232 and I'm still working on the Atlas Craftsman 12 inch lathe and this particular video is devoted to the compound rest. Now that may not seem to be sufficient to be uh, the subject of an entire video but let's give it a try here. And uh, this right here is the compound rest, sometimes just called the compound, I'll probably refer to it as the compound, but this is the area of the lathe where the rubber actually meets the road and that is where the tool post and, and the tool holder and the actual cutting tool is located. So it's an important part of the machine, so let's talk a little bit about it. The compound rest has a T-slot on the top and that's the portion where the uh, the T of the uh, tool holder goes. Now these are different sizes on different lathes. They're not all the same so do not count on them being standard at all. The dimensions of this. Now there are two set screws here. One, two that allow you to tighten this up or to remove the entire assembly from the lathe but uh, when we're in this position this is considered the zero position on an atlas lathe and that may not be true on all of them and when you turn it at 90 degrees that is 90 degrees and you'll find that there's a little witness mark right here on the compound and there's one on each side to help you but the actual protractor just goes uh, halfway around starting here at zero and then we've got graduations that go all the way around to, to the back side. The purpose of the compound is to allow you to cut tapers or we certainly always use it when we're cutting threads but there are many times when you're not using it at all and we're doing all of our feeding with the cross slide but uh, since we don't use it all the time or we don't advance our tool into the work all the time it's most convenient to keep keep this set uh, not at uh, zero the way you see it now because the two cranks interfere with each other and your hands get in the way you see there's very little clearance here so the normal place to keep it is at uh, 29 degrees because that's the angle that we uh, use for threading and it's just a handy place to keep the thing and then the, the two cranks do not interfere with one another by the same token you don't want to keep it all the way in this position or over here because you're going to find that it interferes with the, uh, the tail stock. So keep it in this position 29 degrees and lock it down. Now in order to see the protractor and you have to look on the other side you may want to make sure that's cleaned uh, real well with steel wool, no corrosion on it and I often use a magnifying glass and a flashlight so that I can see it. With this close-up perhaps you can see just a little bit better uh, the zero line here, the witness line on the compound itself and the protractor. Keep it clean and uh, be careful not to damage it in any way. This compound is in particularly good condition because apparently this lathe has not had much use or the person that did use it was pretty knowledgeable and careful. But quite often you're going to see that compounds, and this is an old compound that came out of a, off of a, a South Bend lathe, are incredibly chewed up right here where they strike the chuck. Now this one came out of a school and you're almost always going to find them in that condition in a school. Also some uh, Charles Atlas type guy tightened down the the uh, tool post so tight and he probably had it off center that he broke out the entire casting. So you do not need to over tighten it. It needs to be tight and snug but uh, you're using short wrenches so that you don't have too much leverage. Don't put a long adjustable wrench on there because then you're getting too much leverage and young people often just don't have a sense of how tight they need to make it, so be careful with that. The compound is actually a machine slide on dovetails. Can you see the dovetails here? And it's built uh, similar to the cross slide itself. And looking at it on this side, there are 
three screws here to tighten the gib and I'm going to cover that a little bit later in this video and uh, right in this wider slot here is the gib. Notice that there's there's no uh, width there at all but the, the gib is in there and I'll take that apart here in a second to show you that. There's a graduated collar here that reads in thousandths of an inch. As noted in earlier videos the older lathes were very small collars and very hard to read, especially when you consider there's 100 graduations and the diameter of this is only about an inch. That's why I made uh, a video of uh, me making larger collars for a Logan lay that were much easier to see, especially for senior citizens. And in these earlier lays, they weren't doing any satin chrome finish uh, yet, so it, they're hard to read. Sometimes a dial indicator will help you uh, and certainly uh, what I mean by a dial indicator is putting a dial indicator up here so you can see how far uh, you're feeding but then again most of your feeding is going to be done with uh, this collar down here on the cross slide. There are times when you're taking a finishing cut and it just isn't accurate enough to feed in a half a thousandths or so on one of these collars here. So a good way to do that is to set the compound here at six degrees, which is just a little bit off of uh, the horizontal position here. Set it at six degrees and then each time you feed it in one thousandth and look at this picture as the tool is actually going to advance a tenth of a thousandth. So that's a good trick and this came out of a popular science from the 40s or it might have been a popular mechanics. So if you set it for six degrees and actually here they show you five and a five and three quarters well you're not going to even be able to read that so we're going to call it six degrees and that'll give you uh, a cut that is a tenth of a thousandth for those final passes when you're trying to get a critical dimension. Now I'll remove the compound from the lathe and in order to do that on an atlas lathe loosen up both of these screws one on each side back them way out and then you need to wiggle and at some point it's going to come off right there now if this has, hasn't been off the lathe in years and years and years, you're going to find there's little pins here I'm going to show you. It might help you to take the screw all the way out and reach in there with a, a magnet and see if you can pull the pin out. Also you might spray some uh, WD-40 or some kind of penetrant in there just in case these, uh, these pins, which I'm going to pull out here in a second, are stuck and you can't seem to get it off. Whatever you do, do not pry on this. Do not put a screwdriver or, or a, a wedge of any kind in here where you're going to damage that because this surface needs to be perfect. And you can see the way this is built now with an angle in here. It's built exactly the opposite of a South Bend who puts that uh, round dovetail, actually this is a round dovetail, uh, they mount it on the compound itself rather than on the cross slide. Also uh, you're going to find on a South Bend lay those set screws are way out front. Some of them use a socket head screw, others use a square one that also has a tendency to get hit by the chuck jaws by a careless operator. Now when you look at this you can see the graduations and the zero is right here and it goes to 90 this way and 90 the other way and there are no graduations at all here, protractor graduations on this portion of it. Everything is off to the right. Before I take the compound apart let me show you a few other attachments that are available and will mount right here on this round dovetail and one of course that everybody knows about and perhaps you have one is the milling attachment and that mounts exactly the same as the compound like that 
and it tightens down the same way and can be swung around at different angles. Handy attachment to have, especially if you do not own a Bridgeport mill. And I have shown this and talked about this in other videos. When I bought this lathe last year, several other attachments, uh, accessories came with it. And one of them is this uh, boring table, I believe is what they call it. And there's different names for it. And this is the same table that uh, will go on their little uh, drilling device. And I have to clean this up. It is still kind of rusty and dirty. I'm not sure it has ever been used. But the purpose of this, and it was sold in the uh, Atlas catalog, and I think in the Sears catalog. And you can see how rusty that is. But it attaches in the same way in place of the compound, like that, can be turned in, uh, at different angles, and the work can be clamped uh, in these jaws and tightened down. I see there's great limitations in this in regards to the height, because there just isn't any way to change the height on it other than to move the work up and down uh, in the vice jaws, but that could be set at an angle, and I doubt very much I will ever use this because I'm going to mount it on the drilling attachment. That'll be shown uh, in some other videos, but not necessarily in this uh, Atlas series that I'm doing right now. And that can be tightened also with the same two screws. That's cast iron, it's made quite nicely, it's quite heavy. There may be some other attachments that go on here that were made by Atlas. I'm not aware of them, but I have seen people uh, produce shop-made uh, accessories, particularly the one I'm thinking about was a taper-turning attachment that went right onto this round dovetail. Be very careful you do not lose these, uh, these pins here. And I like to pull them out with a magnet. Sometimes I put a little white grease on them to hold them in place when I reassemble it and to assure that they don't ever stick. But there's two of them and the screws push against them in order to lock this onto the dovetail. So you must orient these when you uh, uh, reassemble it such that that angle goes into the dovetail as such, not at some other angle where you're not truly going to lock it and you're probably going to damage this. And these are ground or machined at the factory and they're hardened at uh, 30 degrees if you ever have to remake one or you lose it. So hang on to those and the same ones are used on uh, the other two attachments that I show you but they, they came with their own. You don't have to reuse these but if you're careless when you move this around or in storage you're going to lose them. That's why you'll find that uh, when these attachments were new such as the milling attachment they actually had a piece of wood in here that held them in place uh, during shipping. I'm going to take the compound apart so you can see how it's done. Not that this one needs service but if they're dirty and out of adjustment you may want to disassemble them, clean them and lubricate them uh, from time to time if you got that extra time so uh, I'll start by taking the gibs out uh, or the gib out and uh, that is done by removing these uh, or loosening at least these three screws. Now there are a total of four of them on the cross slide but there's three right here and be careful you don't lose anything and these are five sixteenths Diameter, so I like to use these little ignition wrenches and just back them off and I'm going to show you how to adjust them later. Now this happens to be in uh, that doesn't fit in there uh, in, in perfect adjustment right now, but I'm going to lose the adjustment. But let me tell you something about what it says in some of the books. Since uh, you seldom use the compound for some of the purposes that I, I've told you, some people keep it locked, that is, they tighten these down so that you, you pretty much can't crank this and that eliminates one portion uh, of the lathe where there might be looseness or uh, that would cause chatter or a poor finish but I don't like to do that I like to just keep it snug so those three are loose 
and now I can back the screws out and that needs to be a, a, a rather small screwdriver and so on with the three screws backed off this gib can now be remo removed now notice I put a little file mark on there I like to mark everything I'm not sure you can put this in backwards but uh, I like to mark things and notice you can see a little bit of the gib right down in here but now if that's loose the gib should pull right out note that there are three little dimples here in which the, the screws uh, uh, tighten up against uh, on the gib and that keeps the gib from sliding in and out you're going to find uh, different lathes use different methods uh, for instance Hardens uses a, a tapered gib don't lose those don't damage it if you, should you find any little nicks on there take them off uh, with a file this one looks in real good shape but I see a little corrosion here so I will clean that up in order to complete the assembly disassembly you have to take out these two screws I've already got one out and back out the other one it won't really come out the other way now one of my uh, criticisms of these atlas lays is, is that some of the parts are cheaply made for instance this is a die casting here but now the whole thing can be pulled out set that aside for just a moment there it is and there's the brass nut and if you want it out or need to replace it the screw will allow you to remove it and on older lathes well-worn lathes you're going to find that there is wear see how that's held in you're going to find that there'll be a lot of wear on both the screw and the nut but uh, sometimes since the nut is softer that is what uh, has uh, sacrificed its life and you can just buy the new nuts and there are I believe these are still available from either Sears or Atlas but there's also people on eBay I think that remake these and you can buy them fairly reasonable you're not going to be able to make your own unless you buy an Acme tap of this size and that would be much much more expensive than buying replacement parts now I will clean this real well with solvent and then re-oil it I'll do that off camera and I'm not going to take it apart here because there's really no need to do that if you get uh, backlash on a lathe both in the uh, cross slide and the compound this is where you're going to get the backlash uh, well there'll always be some backlash but when they get sloppy you'll have tremendous backlash in here also you can see how this is made now no chips in there sometimes these are absolutely packed with chips but I will clean this real well I will also clean this real well no chips up in there well there's one chip that's all I see really in very nice condition remarkable condition that's an oil hole and you can see that that would allow oil to drip directly onto the screw this lathe is in uh, such clean good condition it didn't take me very long perhaps uh, 15 minutes to clean this all up with solvent wipe it down and now it's ready to be oiled if you run into any high spots or burrs strike it with a file such as this to get off any high spots that a hammer and chisel mechanic may left may have left uh, if you have any little divots or uh, or holes they don't hurt a thing you want to get rid of the high spots so that's all very clean keep it clean as you reassemble it and just use a 20 weight oil that's non-detergent and everything must be oiled as you reassemble it so I'm just going to reverse everything here and uh, there's the nut in very good condition 
and the thread is exceptionally good condition, really like brand new. And I cleaned the collar, the graduated collar there just a little bit uh, with some fine steel wool. Here we go. Plenty of oil there in the dovetails. And I didn't take these these uh, screws out. You can you can do that if you th think it's necessary. See how that goes? Do not tighten this yet. It should be loose so that it uh, can align itself as we put the screw in. That's a right hand screw, it is not a left hand thread. You see it, it'll swing yet so that it aligns itself. Next these two screws can be tightened. You can do some of this work while the compound is actually mounted on the lathe and that, that kind of acts like a vise to hold it, but I'm just doing it loose on the bench. In fact, I'll tighten those a little more later. Now, this needs to be tightened real tight because the alignment has happened. Otherwise, you might get some binding as you, as you try to uh, get the whole thing together. <clears throat> Remember, the gib is not in there yet. At long last, I'm ready to put the gib in, and remember how you put it in so you don't get it in backwards. That's why you want to mark things, or take a picture of them. I took one screw out so you can see how it's made, and how it fits into the little divots. And I also took it out so that I can look through the hole hopefully and see one of these uh, dimples so that I know how far to put it in as far as the, the, the length wise here because I've already forgotten how much would stick out one end or the other and I've got an ice pick in here that will allow me also to feel that so that I align the three screws with the three dimples it's ready to mount back on the lathe. The gibs have not been tightened, but they are in place, just kind of loose, and by wiggling the, uh, the gib here a little bit, I know that the screws are in the correct position. I tightened this. I may have mentioned that before. Now is your last chance, or not the last chance, but a good chance to put a little extra oil there, wherever you need it, right into the, the, the uh, dovetail both sides you can oil the screw again because that extra oil is just going to run right through and down so it's not going to hurt anything other than it is a bit messy and then with this nice and clean a couple drops of oil on that did you notice when I took this apart a few minutes ago that there was plenty of oil on uh, all surfaces I know there's plenty of oil on the other parts also, but this couldn't hoit. Get oil in there. There are two ways of putting these pins in now. One is to insert them uh, right now, trying to orient them correctly, but I prefer this method where I remove these screws and then after the compound is mounted, I, uh, I slide them in and remember that the correct orientation is like this. So, on the compound goes, and I'll back these screws out. And they go in again like this. And I'll put a couple drops of oil on each one and 
screw them in home or you can push them in with a magnet but be careful you don't uh, rotate them or push them in with a screwdriver you'll feel them uh, as to whether or not they're in there correctly and be able to determine how much thread is remaining here on these screws if you can remember what it looked like before you took it apart assembly is complete and notice that uh, this screw here has about two threads showing as does this one so we know that the little pins are in the correct orientation the last thing to do is to adjust the gibbs and what I'm going to show you now applies to the the gibbs on the cross slide or really just about any gibbs on any machine and all machine slides have gibbs and for the moment I'll just lock it <clears throat> pardon me in that position because you, you can see what I'm doing here and again a screwdriver about this size and uh, and 5 sixteenths uh, wrench and this is kind of like adjusting tappets if uh, some of you have uh, adjusted tappets you older guys have you know what I'm talking about now at the moment this is kind of tight so I will back them out and sometimes even a smaller screwdriver like this is, is sufficient but the idea is that all three of them needed need to be adjusted equally and have equal pressure on the gib as you tighten the screws you, you need to be cranking this compound in and out until you find that sweet spot not too hard not too easy then this one notice that I haven't tightened the nuts at all yet what you have to be careful on one like this at the moment this portion right here is hanging out and is not in contact with the dovetail so you can tighten this too tight and then you'll find that you can't feed the compound in so when you snug this one up move the compound in so that the screw is in alignment there with at least some of the cross slide and, and I can feel that one is too tight as I go in so I need to back this one out just a little bit yeah I feel better that one was too tight when you get all three of them just the way you want remember what I said about tappets put that on there I like to use a box wrench like this and then you can hold the box wrench with one hand and the screwdriver now I've gone to a little bit bigger screwdriver and tighten it but do, do not let the screw itself turn snug it up don't break it off same with this one and this one and then check it again until you get them just so and they feel just right well I got a little bit of looseness there but I have the middle one uh, loose yet and I'll tell you why in a second sometimes the double crank right here is annoying and on my other Atlas lathe before I bought it someone had cut it off at first I thought maybe they broke it off but I believe they cut it off because it was annoying to have the double here but in some cases it's it's uh, nice if you're feeding slowly but if if uh, you want to feed uh, in a long ways one uh, handle interferes with the other but the reason that I didn't tighten the middle gib yet is that I told you earlier there are times when you want to basically lock the compound for whatever reason and I'm gonna do that right now because I haven't tightened the nut there and I'm just going to tighten that middle one fairly tight and now I mean I can turn it but it's difficult so I consider that to be locked right now if someone has done that on your lathe make sure you back those out and don't force this because you'll cause wear on the gib and wear on the screw and the nut so now I'm going to back that off just a little bit and then off camera I will lock the nut and then it's just right if you have too much play you're going to get vibration and then probably chatter or a poor finish because of that 
So adjusting the Gibbs is something that's important. You need to spend a lot of time on it and just master that because it's a never-ending battle to get them just so. And then, too, there's going to be wear from time to time, and you need to take that wear up with the gib and that is the purpose of the gib not only that but in the manufacturing of the lathe so they don't have to struggle too much with uh, a final dimension but that uh, the gibs can be adjusted to compensate for wear and all machine slides are made with gibs and that really completes the adjustment there I've adjusted the compound for 29 degrees, which I consider to be its home position. I've tightened the two bolts, one, two, and then these still need tightening because uh, it was a little hard to do that on the bench, but now that this is held securely, I can... Oops, need a bigger screwdriver. Tighten those up. Also, when you assemble it here, make sure that you get the graduation here, the, the zero mark for the graduation, the witness mark on the, uh, on the top side, not turned upside down. For your information, the screw inside of the compound is 10 threads per inch, meaning that each revolution of the screw or the crank will move the compound in 100 thousandths. Now, these dials are calibrated such that they are what is sometimes called a radius reading, meaning if I move in ten thousandths, it's going to take off ten thousandths. Or should I restate that? If I turn the dial ten thousandths, the compound is going to move ten thousandths. So I will do just that now. I'll move this uh, in ten thousandths. I got it set on zero. And notice that the uh, dial indicator moved ten thousandths. If we were cutting uh, work, if we were turning work, and we moved it in ten thousandths, it would take twenty thousandths off of the diameter. And the reason for that is that uh, it's taking ten thousandths off of each side. Now continuing here with the dial, I've already moved it uh, ten thousand, but I'm going to turn it a uh, 90 thousandths more, which is a full revolution, and you'll see that that will have traveled exactly 100 thousandths. Or the tool would ha will have gone into the work 100 thousandths and taking off 200 thousandths. Most of the dials on older lathes are set up that way, and certainly all of them on Atlas lathes are that way, but you may not find that true on some lathes, particularly my Closing lays, if you move it in ten thousandths, it'll take off uh, exactly ten thousandths. Keep that in mind when you're turning to diameter. Just a little information about backlash, if you don't know anything about it. Uh, this lathe is very tight and there's very little backlash, but I am able to turn the crank just a little bit, this much, which is probably five thousandths without the indicator moving. So that's the amount of backlash. Very little backlash. Now you're going to see a lot more of that in the older lathes, and there'll be more backlash probably in the cross slide than there is in the compound because this gets used much more often. Here's an example where it would be very convenient uh, to have the dials and the setup as it is, where moving it in 10,000 takes off 10,000. For example, if I were to be facing this work and I have already uh, touched off and taken a cut and determined that I want perhaps 15,000 off, I would be able to dial it in directly here with the, with the compound rest. Of course, I would want to lock the carriage here so that the entire carriage doesn't get pushed back when I engage the work, but th this would be uh, most handy now to move it in a certain amount and have it take off that amount. That's a good application for that. The compound rest method of turning a taper is ideal for short tapers and tapers that uh, do not uh, involve the center, but you can see here in a previous video I've cut a seven degree taper on here and the compound is presently set at that uh, seven degrees, the carriage locked, and the cutting is done in this manner 
without moving the carriage at all. All of the, the tool movement is done with the compound rest. And that's one of the three methods of turning a taper on the lathe. And that completes this video on the compound rest for the Atlas lathe. Hope you enjoyed this and can put uh, this information to, to use and uh, wipe off the excess oil because I did over oil a little bit, but that's a good thing. And in the next video, I'm going to cover the cross slide in a, a, a similar type of video, taking all of that apart. So this is Tubal Cain saying so long for now.